Hi everyone, I'm Maureen McCoy. I'm a registered dietitian and also a senior lecturer in the College of Health Solutions at Arizona State University. Um, there I'm the degree director for the Food and Nutrition Entrepreneurship degree, as well as the faculty advisor for the Pitchfork Pantry, which is our student run food pantry that focuses on providing food to any student that may need it. So I'm excited to be here today. What is a, what is a food and I'm, I'm a chef uh, and I built restaurants and did all that back in the day, but I never thought of myself as a food and nutrition entrepreneur. What is a food and nutrition entrepreneur? <laughs> you might have missed out on, on a new title for yourself. <laughs> so uh, a food and nutrition entrepreneur is someone who maybe is not going to become a registered dietitian specifically, but may be interested in forming their own type of nutrition or food business, um, starting something online, starting a new company, so it really takes that creative spirit, which I think I have seen that you have, Mark. So I think we can fit you into this category. Yes. Um, but it's it's a it's a cool, exciting degree. I think there's um, there's this explosion of f new foods and new food ideas. I think as we've become more, continue to be more conscious of of health and wellness. Nutrition is the third leg of that stool, right? It's fitness, wellness, and nutrition. And so nutrition's a big part of, of us. Yeah. And I think that as we've become more aware of that, we're paying more attention. If we look at all the specialty diets and we look at the special foods and we look at um, sustainability, the impact of the food we eat on the planet, how much, I mean, I'm going on and on, but how much water it takes to, to raise uh, you know, a pound of beef, by the way, how much water it takes to raise a pound of almonds versus yeah. all of those kinds of things. So, so is your world kind of all of that? It's, it's a lot of that. And that's a very, it's a very big picture. So sometimes it can be overwhelming, I think, to find your, your niche yeah. in that, but it is, it, it is all of that. I'm really interested also in, uh, and we, we've had on the show the, the lab grown meats and the cellular based meats and the plant based proteins and all of those. I was raw vegan for five years. And what was interesting was um, learning how to make cheese. And I was like, well, it's not cheese. It's a it's a nut spread that's been fermented, but it's not cheese. Why do you, you, you kind of need to call it something that people are familiar with. Do you, do you struggle with that at all as I do? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I, I love that you're making it yourself because sometimes some of the things on the market, the ingredient list can get quite oh, yeah. no. lengthy, yeah. which is always a little concerning. I like to keep it as, you know, as clean as possible, but it is, it's all those new food products and finding new ways to keep the sustainable food system. Cause again, we're going to run out of water soon the beef you said, I mean, there's a lot of issues coming down the pike. Michael Pollan had said, if um, you're reading the ingredients and that ingredient didn't exist when your grandmother was around, <laughs> then probably don't eat the food. Exactly. Uh, I like that so rule. I, 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 I love that. <laughs> However, what what's the other part that's interesting about this conversation is when I was 20, uh, I was running the off-campus food service at UCSB, our, our right. university here. And I had $2.65 a day to feed them three meals, oh. all they could eat, or all they could throw back at me if they didn't like it. Right. Um, and I, I, I learned about this relationship with, between college students and food. But what I've learned is that in the last 10 years, we have this new problem where the students just don't have the food. And, and I don't know on what planet that exists, but it exists now and it's bad. It is. It's really bad. And it, it's something that I wasn't totally aware of earlier before either. I mean, when you think about a college student, it's like, well, you know, they got into college. They have some funding to support themselves through that. I'm sure they're fine. But when we look at the numbers, we're seeing one in three and one in four college students are food insecure or not 
that unsure, that uncertainty about where their next meal is going to come and when it's going to come, which those numbers, that's higher than the general population. That is, um, uh, there's a Forbes article that came out in August that said, um, to your, I mean, to your point, 39% of the yeah. students um, have food insecurity. Um, well, well, first off, why don't we explain how, how is it that that has come to pass? And that's a great question. I, I think that there is a piece of it is that increased awareness of it. Um, there's always been that kind of mantra that like the college student diet is the ramen diet, right? Like right. why? And that's been normalized for a very long time. So I think this could have been an ongoing problem previously, but I think we've, we've really looked at it recently and it's like, well, is that what we're hoping for for our college students is to subsist on ramen and be couch surfing because they also don't have a stable housing situation like that's not what i want to see in our college students right right so is it that um all of you know, i'm just trying to figure out it's either is it relegated to scholarship students or is it um you know because if i'm thinking if mom and dad are paying full freight, then they're going to make sure you eat, you know, you're going to say, Hey, I don't, you know, send another check. But yeah. if I got in through scholarship, because I'm super smart, and I, I earned my way in, but I, I come from a, you know, a lower middle or, uh, you know, that class, and I don't have, I might be the first kid uh, in the family to go to college. Yeah. And it's like, Hey, let's just get you there. And we'll figure it out. I mean, we're seeing a little bit of everything, honestly. Mm. I mean, there are those students that, you know, mom and dad, the family has got it covered. But nowadays, that is not that common, honestly. Students are relying on scholarships, and there is a fair amount of financial aid and scholarships out there. But when you pay tuition, and then you pay rent, and you pay for books, like food is the very last thing on that list of yeah. like things to pay for for students. So, and I think the cost of all of that has just consistently risen over time. And, and it's really, I mean, a student just can't, they just can't afford to, to have a meal every day sometimes. And they, their job isn't a job. Their job is being a student. Well, exactly. And that's what we hope for them. But unfortunately, right. like so many of my students, they work full time. And, and to manage that with these heavy course loads, it's I mean, it's literally impossible. So, yeah. So let's go down that path we were talking about earlier about wellness, fitness and nutrition. Yeah. I'm thinking that the, the if if my wellness stool on my little tripod stool that I'm living on yep. is not is wobbly. Mm -hmm. Then I then I'm guessing that affects my wellness because I'm not able to maybe I'm not sleeping I'm worrying I'm stressed I'm stressed about a bunch I'm I'm 20 years old if I'm you know what do I know um, so it's impacting that and I'm guess I'm gonna guess here that they probably don't have a fitness routine uh, you know because they I couldn't afford a gym so maybe they work out at home but now yeah, they. they that's a choice that's probably below the food thing am i right on that i mean we do have a rec center on campus that students do pay for as part of their built-in <laughs> tuition okay. structure okay. so fitness could be built into the equation but also if a student doesn't have enough energy because they haven't eaten then right. again right the exercise also right. goes by the wayside so right, right. so now you're on potentially one leg and also when we think about the mental health piece of that picture, right, right the stress and the lack of sleep, right. like that's just that negative cycle now that we've started in these in these students. So I'm guessing the negative, the, the worst negative outcome is they don't do well at school, they, um, they have to forfeit their scholarship and they just have to, they have to back out. Yeah. Um, uh, let, let's hope that, you know, the social safety net thing, the programs like you're doing and and the ones I've read about are helping. I, I read in the Forbes article about a program called SNAP, mm -hmm. where there's, tell us about SNAP. Yeah, so SNAP is the formerly named food stamp program. So it's the supplemental oh, okay. nutrition assistance program. 
Um, they actually, during COVID, the legislature made some changes to it in which the changes they made made it applicable for 6 million more students to qualify for SNAP. Oh. Because there are a lot of requirements that have to be made in order to qualify and meet sure. all of those sure, is hard sure, sure. for a college student. But with these changes, a lot more students qualify. Unfortunately, students are not applying for SNAP. Is it because are, they don't know about it? That's a piece of it. Um, there's a lot of steps to it. And sometimes they get a few steps in and it's like, I don't know what I'm doing here. Like, mm. I don't have the time to do this. Mm. And it's just mm. done. A part of it could be the, the stigma associated with asking for help. That's a big part of it as well. I'm, I'm thinking of the, the young adult TV series we, we watch where you've got the kid who comes from the other side of the tracks and, you know, they don't want anybody to know. Yeah. Um, my, my wife teaches, um, during COVID was teaching storytelling to high school kids. None of them had their cameras on because of the, of the situation where they, they would shame one another or just yeah. on the background, exactly. right? You know, um, things that I don't even think about, but, uh, I'm, I'm glad someone's thinking about that. What's your sense of, I mean, one in three is a, that's a lot of kids. It, is it getting the attention? This is this issue getting the attention it deserves. I think it's starting to. There's some initiatives going on at the policy level, which I think is ultimately where it needs to get to. Right. Um, in terms of initiatives like swipe out hunger, in which students can donate their extra meal swipes. They all, if they purchase a meal program, they oh. may have extra meals left over at the end of a semester. And those oh. could be donated to a student who might need them. Like that. So that's a piece of it. Um, encouraging more students to uh, be on SNAP and having people who can help students walk through that process with them to ensure that they're getting those resources. So there is in certain states, there has been some legislation passed to help those pieces of it. Um, a lot of it is, is state by state at this point. So I, I think it's, it's one of those growing issues that people are like, oh, college students, really? Right. Like how we started this conversation. So it's right. gaining some traction. Is this... Um... A lot of times uh, when you when you come upon these issues, you wonder, well, OK, where is the buck stop on this? Yeah. Is it at is it at the school level? Is it at the state level or is it at the federal level? Yeah, I've talked about this a lot with my colleagues and we've kind of played with like, I mean, what is the solution? Because students having to donate extra meal swipes, that doesn't seem like, you know, there's other solutions that we could take it even to a, a higher level. Something I've been thinking about recently, and it's been proposed a little bit, is kind of that continuation of the National School Lunch Program. Oh, National oh. School Lunch covers K through 12. And then right. as soon as a student graduates high school, they go now into this college system where they're now paying for school. They're right, now right, paying right, right, for right, right, right. everything. And yet we've taken all of those safety nets away from them. So that would be a, one would think a simple change, but nothing, it doesn't feel like anything simple anymore, does it? Uh, there, there would be some, some money that would be needed to put towards that. But imagine if we still had kind of that free reduced paid, although now with some of the COVID legislation, it's universally free meals for now. Um, but I think those changes have been fantastic for K through 12. And we can't just assume that these college students magically learned how to do their finances, learned how to cook, because cooking skills is a whole nother piece. How do you cook on a budget? So without those skill sets, I mean, we've really left these students to their own devices and it, it's not going very well. Let's stay on that for a second. We had the, um, we had the head of the Santa Barbara Food Bank Okay. Uh, on our TED stage uh, in 2019. Thanks. And I got to go visit. Uh, I'd not been there before. It, it's extremely impressive and didn't realize the, the, the large network they have with farmers and restaurants. And, you know, they're, they're, from what I could tell, food's not being wasted. 
you know, it's, it's, it's getting there. But he said the challenges, and this is to your point, because mm -hmm. I saw, I, I don't know what it was. It was like, I, like, it felt like a ton of green beans. It was just this huge industrial container of green yeah. beans. And I said, can you even give those away? And he said, they don't know how to cook them. Exactly. So what they had learned, you know, this was years ago, but what they'd learned was part of their mandate was to offer these cooking classes, right? So that they would learn, you could come and get these good, wholesome, nutritious foods and learn how to cook. Mm -hmm. Me cooking since I was five, I have a hard time relating with someone who's like, uh, I don't know, yeah. but yeah. I know there's people like that. So are you looking at that part of the problem as well? Yeah, I mean, like at our food pantry, we do a fair amount. We have a director of nutrition education, one of the students in our nutrition department, actually. And she does Instagram posts. She does Instagram videos on all those cooking skills. Because, yeah, giving a student a, a bag of dried beans, which is what we get from the food bank often, it's like, I, I don't think any student is going home to soak those beans. And right, like all those steps, it's like, that's not happening. So oh, I think gosh. that's. Like it is possible to eat on a budget as we know, but I mean, it takes some, it takes some knowledge to, to get yourself there. Mo, I am so glad that you are paying attention to this problem and, uh, and hopefully we'll see this thing get resolved sooner rather than later. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you so much.